Grace and peace to you, friends. I am Reverend Dr. Stacy Cole Wilson, the Executive Minister of Justice and Service for the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church. Welcome to Everyone Counts, our webinar series. Today, we will be speaking with Veronica Tubman of the Internal Revenue Service. She is the Senior Stakeholder Liaison. And our topic is Acquiring Economic Impact Payment Information. And we invite you to please live tweet with us at every hashtag Everyone Counts. You can also find more information about our webinar, webinar series at bwcumc.org slash everyone counts. Again, we will have all of these recordings on our YouTube station and we will send uh, all of the slides to those who've registered. Our website for just the Baltimore Wash for more information about the Baltimore Washington Conference is bwcumc.org. There you can learn about all the great things that we're doing and how we can partner in this good work together. First, I'd like to introduce our speaker and then we will go to God in prayer. Again, our presenter is Senior Stakeholder Liaison, Veronica Tubman. She is an employee of the Internal Revenue Service and as a stakeholder liaison, she focuses on providing, hold on one moment, please, providing educational outreach to small business owners, self-employed individuals, as well as practitioners, payroll preparers, other tax professionals, and industry partners throughout Maryland. She is firmly committed to increasing educational resources while maintaining open lines of communications and developing working partnerships. Veronica started her career with the IRS in 1984. Her career in collection has led, to a, led her to a diversity of positions as revenue officer, locator, services coordinator, lead cost management tax force, program analyst, disclosure specialist, analyst and technical services reviewer, advisor, and a variety of other areas throughout the South Atlantic region. Veronica feels it is imperative to provide guidance on proper IRS procedures and policies to our communities and on a timely basis to promote voluntary compliance. Veronica is married to a wonderful husband. She, has also, she also has two dynamic children and one grain angel. She enjoys gardening, hunting, and fishing in her spare time. She is a lifelong member of Union Memorial United Methodist Church in Baltimore, serving proudly in the community. Please help me welcome her after our invocation by Ann Price, an invocation for the nation. Most holy and merciful Father, we come before your presence thanking you for every individual in our midst today including our presenter and all other participants. Lord, we share our gratitude to you for bringing us to this session for the opportunity to hear, to question and receive answers, and then to act together as we work for justice for all individuals and businesses during this current unprecedented crisis and into the future. We continue to face illness and death change lives due to the challenges of the global coronavirus. Touch us, heal us, and bless us all as only you have the power to do. Help us to strengthen our faith and give us the strength to carry on with you as the wind beneath our wings. Holy Lord, let all that happens in this session be to your glory and that of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Anne. And I also would like to give thanks to all of the other team members who helped to bring this presentation to you today. Giovanni Arroyo, Rochelle Andrews, Jan Taylor, Anne Price, and Rochelle, An Rochelle Andrews and Dr. Sonia King. God bless you. Ms. Tubman, we invite you to lead us. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. And I prayerfully you can hear me. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for uh, an ability to serve the community, uh, to be in Christ as one, and to provide economic impact payments for businesses and employee retention credit. Now, I will also like to add that my contact information will be at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. The employee retention credit was established as part of the Corona Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or we call it the CARES Act. And that is what it is. 
Um, the Treasury Department of the Internal Revenue Service launched this designed to encourage and help businesses to keep employees on their payroll, which is also very important. The refundable tax credit is 50% up to $10,000 in qualified wages. Now that's including um, qualified health plan expenses as well for the entire business. And that's because everyone, as we know, has been experiencing hardships related to COVID-19. The credit is available to all employers, regardless of size, including tax exempt organizations. Now, the only exception to this is state and local governments and their instruments. So let's take a look at this. What is the employee retention? Uh, we're gonna go back one. Sorry about that. And as we had said, the credit is fully refundable for employers equal to 50% of the qualified wages, as we had said, that eligible employers pay their employees. Now, the employee retention credit applies to qualified wages paid after March 12th of this year and before January 1st of next year. And just to reiterate, the maximum amount of the qualified wage taken into account with respect to each employee is for calendar quarter and that's ten thousand dollars so now that means the maximum credit for an eligible employer for qualified wages paid to an employee is five thousand dollars so the credit applies against um employment taxes specifically the employer's uh, share of social security okay let's move on now we're going to talk about eligible employer and at any point, if anyone has any questions, I really uh, welcome you to put those in the chat and we will take a look at those um, just to make sure. The thing that I do ask is that you not include any personal identifiable information, which would be social security number or names of that nature. So let's move on. So the credit is available to all employers, as we had said, regardless of size, including tax exempt organizations. Now there are two notable exceptions federal, state, and local governments, and, there, um, and those are the exceptions. Some people are receiving um, funding from the state and local governments, and that is where the difference is. Eligible employers must fall into one of these two categories. Um, the employer's business is fully or particularly suspended by government order during the COVID-19 during the calendar quarter. The business is fully or partially suspends operation during the calendar year. And that is limiting commerce, travel, meetings, and things of that nature as a result of COVID-19. And also for anyone that's on the call that has some questions regarding the, uh, city or state funding related to COVID-19, make sure you provide my inf you, me your information and I will um, get you in touch with someone from the state and local governments. And as a result of that, the employer's gross receipts are below 50%, and that's below 50% when you compare it to what your wages were and your gross receipts were from last year. So once the employer's gross receipts go above 80% of what you compare it to for last year, then they are no longer eligible. And that's something to keep in mind. Moving on, operations fully or partially suspended. A significant decline in gross receipts begins with the first quarter. And we know that the first quarter are um, the first four months of the year, there are three quarters, in which an employer's gross receipts for a calendar quarter is 20%, as we had said, or less than 50% of the gross receipts for the same quarter. And that's the good thing about this. We're using a comparison from what your receipts were for last year, and that will help you make that designation. And that's a significant decline in gross receipts from the first quarter of last year, as we had said. So let me give you an example of what I mean. An employer's gross receipts were 100,000, 190,000, and 230,000 in the first, second, and third quarters of 2020. Its gross receipts were 210,000, 230,000, and 250,000 in the first, second, and third quarters of last year. So the employer's 2020 first, second, and third gross receipts were approximately 48%, 83%, and 92% of a decline 
and that's where the comparison comes in for the first quarter. So that is why the employer is entitled to the retention credit with respect to the first and second quarters of last year. So that's where the credit comes into difference. For the, um, we were talking about this year, it was 100,000, 190,000 and 230,000 for this year. And then from last year, it was 210,000, 230,000 and 250,000. So just kind of get a visual in your head. And that is why the employer is eligible for the first and second quarters only. They have basically the same or comparative gross receipts from the third quarter of last year. Sig significant decline in gross receipts. Let's move on and talk about that. A significant decline and gross receipts begins with the first quarter as we had stated. And, and I am continuing to reiterate this because I need to make sure that you are looking at the comparison. So that will let you know that you are eligible for that. And this is just a visual representation of what we discussed. So does make sure that you have that information available from your bookkeeper or your accountant or whether or not you keep your own records and make that comparison. And that is where the difference comes in at. And this is basically a visual of what we just talked about. Okay, are there any questions in the chat? Can we take a look at that? Because I know it's a lot of information and I just need to make sure that we walk through this together. Okay, I don't want to confuse anybody. It seems okay so far. All right, so we're moving on to qualified wages. Qualified wages are wages and compensation paid by an eligible employer to employees after March 12th, 2020 and before January 1st of 2021. Now, qualified wages include eligible employers' qualified health plan expenses that are properly, um, and that is in relation to wages. So just remember, if you are an employer and you have qualified health uh, plan expenses, those are taken into account as well. Now, the CARE Act does not require employers to pay qualified wages. The purpose of this is basically try to give you a bit of a break because you're not making that income. In addition, eligible employers may elect or not claim the credit for the employee retention credit. Now, just remember that this particular credit does require certain employers to pay sick and family leave wages to employees who are unable to work and those that do not have a telework option. And that's as a result of COVID-19. So the thing to think about is either you or your employees are in a position where they cannot work from home and they cannot telework and they are unable to physically come into the office or um, unfortunately, if they are a victim of COVID-19 and they become sick. So that is something you need to take into consideration as well. So the average number of full-time employees is determined, and we're doing this comparison from 2019. So just remember that the shared responsibility, all these rules fall under the Affordable Care Act. And that means that you provide a full-time employee, and that's including an employee who is employed at least 30 hours a week. So even though we consider a 40-hour week to be our week, which is eight hours, um, five days a week. In this particular instance, the employee has to work at least 30 hours and that is what is considered to be full time. Also, if an employer is an eligible employer, only wages paid while operations are fully or partially suspended due to government orders. And that is, it's, we're only talking about the time that the business cannot work. Okay, so we're moving on to qualified wages. And just remember all of this, um, as um, Reverend Wilson had said, will be provided to you on a, a PowerPoint. I'll make sure you have the question and answers and it always as a source, you can always reach out to me. So keep that in mind. I know it's a lot of information. Qualified wages, again, are based on the average number of the business's full-time employees in 2019. Now, employers with 100 employees or less, if the employer had 100 or fewer employees on an average in 2019, then the credit is based on wages paid to all employees, regardless if they provided services or not. 
If the employees work full-time and were paid for full-time work, the employer still receives the credit. And the purpose of the credit is just to make sure that during COVID-19, everybody gets paid and everybody maintains their household. Employers with more than 100 employees, now, if the employer had more than 100, which is the average from 2019, then the credit is allowed only for wages paid to employees for the time they are not providing services. Keep that in mind. For these employers, qualified wages taken into account for an employee may not exceed what the employee would have been paid for working an equivalent duration during the 30 days immediately preceding the period of the economic hardship. And that's what COVID-19 has done. So let's move on to calculating the credit. Try to make this a little clearer. The credit is equal to 50% of the qualified wages paid by the eligible employer with respect to each employee. The amount of qualified wages with respect to any employee for all calendar quarters in 2020, as we keep saying, cannot exceed $10,000. So in other words, there's a $5,000 total cap on the credit per employee for the 2020 tax year. So let's look at our first example. Eligible employer, so he pays $10,000 in qualified wages, we'll say to employee A, and that is um, in the second quarter of 2020. So the employee retention credit available to the eligible employer for the qualified wages paid to employee A is $5,000. So let's look at example two. Eligible employer, he pays employee B $8,000 in qualified wages in the second quarter of 2020 and $8,000 in qualified wages in the third quarter of 2020. The credit available to the eligible employer for qualified wages to, the, to employee B is $4,000. Remember, it's 50%. And then in the last quarter, it's $1,000. I'm sorry, in the second quarter, it's $1,000. And in the third quarter, the overall limit is $10,000. Remember, it's $10,000 on qualified wages per employee for all quarters. Okay, so let's take a look at claiming the credit. Employers can be immediately reimbursed for the credit by reducing their required deposits of payroll taxes that have been withheld from employees' wages by the amount of the credit. Okay, so how does an employer claim the credit? I'm glad you asked. Eligible employers will report their total qualified wages and the related credit for each calendar quarter on their federal employment tax return. And as we know, that's usually a 941 tax return. And that's the employer's quarterly federal tax return. Form 941 is used to report income and Social Security and Medicare taxes withheld by the employer from employee wages as well as the employer portion of Social Security and Medicare tax. So just remember that Medicare portion, the employer has to match what's taken out of the employee's salary. In anticipation of receiving the credit, eligible employers can fund qualified wages by accessing federal employment taxes. Now that's including the withholding taxes that we talked about. They're required to be deposited with the IRS or by requesting an advance of the credit from the IRS. And in order to get the advance, you'd have to file a form 7200. And that is the advance payment um, of the employer credits due to COVID-19. And that will allow you to claim the advance credit for the full amount of the anticipated credit for which it did not have sufficient federal employment tax deposits, which means that you weren't making money, you didn't have enough money, but you wanted to make sure that everybody got paid. And that is where this comes into play. Okay, so let's move on. Now, um, just to make sure, uh, go back just to the last one. I had a couple of points that I wanted to make uh, to help with, thanks. With all things, there are frequently asked questions because, of course, this inf the information changes quite frequently. So we're going to 
take a look at the detailed information and examples, and we're going to take a walk through irs.gov shortly. So against what taxes does the credit apply? The credit is allowed against the employer portion of the Social Security. Remember, the employer pays a portion of our Social Security as employees or employers, and then we pay a portion. And that portion, and also that is related to railroad retirement tax as well. And that's the corresponding por portion of Social Security also. And again, how do I receive the credit? The credits are fully refundable because the eligible employer may get a refund if the amount of the credit is more than certain federal employment taxes. Just remember that, that he owes. Now, this is to the extent the credit exceeds the employer portion of employment taxes, and the credit is treated as an overpayment and is refundable to the employer. So just keep that in mind. The CARES Act prevents double dipping, so you won't be able to take it twice um, as far as the retention goes for the employer deduction for wages. So it has to be deducted by the amount of the retention credit. Okay, moving on. So let's talk about the impact of other provisions that are listed. Okay, so the small business loan, just keep in mind that the um, Paycheck Protection Program, you can take out a small business loan just to ensure that, um, that your payroll is met, paid family and sick leave credit, that's the Family First Act, the work opportunity credit, and then we'll talk about section 4.5.S. So an eligible employer's ability to claim the employment retention credit may be impacted by other credits. So these are other credits that they're entitled to. And remember we talked about, um, unfortunately, the law does not allow double dipping. Okay, so if an employer receives a small business interruption loan, under the Paycheck Protection Program, now that's authorized under CARES, which deals with COVID-19, an employer, an eligible employer receives tax credits for qualified leave and wages. Those wages are not eligible as payroll costs, so keep that in mind, for purposes of receiving loan forgiveness under this act. Wages for the credit do not include wages for which the employer received a tax credit. Now we're talking about the paid family and sick leave credit under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And that's our second bullet. Employers are not counted for the credit if the employer is allowed a work opportunity credit under this particular section per employee. Now just remember, so we're gonna talk about section 45S as we go along. An eligible employer may not claim a credit under Section 4.5.S with respect to the qualified wages for which they receive it. And that's when we were just talking about that employer retention credit. But they may be able to take the credit under this section as it applies to additional wages paid provided the requirements are met. So that's why we're using that as a reference. Okay, we're moving on. Okay, so basically this particular slide provides us with um, getting tax relief on keeping employees on payroll. And you can learn more about the employer tax credits at irs.gov forward slash coronavirus. And we invite you to share this information with your clients, your associates, family, and colleagues. Okay, and I think I saw a question. Let's see, can you address what is available for smaller scale businesses, self-employed and self-employed with no um, employees? Okay, so give me a second. I wanna get to that momentarily. We're gonna get to the end and then I'll go back. So I did not forget your question. All right, okay, we're moving on. And we're talking about an employment credit is available to businesses that pay family leave to employees who are unable to work because they must care for their children and daycare due to the coronavirus. So that's another, another consideration. Okay, and we're moving on. And as we had stated before, if you have an employee unable to work due to the virus, you may be entitled to receive a credit in the full amount of the required sick leave and family leave. Okay. So next we're gonna take a look at some of the resources. And once you receive the presentations, the, all of the links will be fully active. And we're gonna go through um, and take a look 
at what each one looks like. Okay, so let's take a look at the employment retention credit under the CARES Act. Now, that is what we talked about. The refundable credit is 50% of up to $10,000 in wages paid by eligible employees, and we talked about that. And you'll find that on the next slide. And this is what it looks like, all the frequently asked questions that you have available. And we're gonna go in and take a look at those for who's eligible. Okay, so on our next slide, what I did, I pulled some of the frequently asked questions to kind of help us along. And it says, how does an eligible employer claim the employee retention credit for qualified wages? And we talked about that earlier. The eligible employer will report their total qualified wages for purposes of the employee retention credit for each calendar quarter on their federal employment tax return. Employers also report any qualified sick leave or any qualified family leave as well, and they're entitled to the credit on Form 941. Form 941 is used to report, as we know, income and Social Security and Medicare taxes withheld by employers for their employees. So anticipation of this, the employer is able to file a Form 7200, which is an advance payment of employer credits. And just remember, employers pay their federal tax deposits through the electronic federal tax deposit system. And this is all related. We're deferring federal tax deposits and payments through December 31st. And we talked about the frequently asked questions. And this is a, a copy of the example that we had a discussion about. So we're going to move on because we're going to get to some of the FAQ questions. Okay. So May an eligible employer reduce its federal uh, employment tax deposits by qualified wages and get and not have to pay a federal tax deposit penalty. So you're eligible through the calendar year and you will not be subjected to the federal tax deposit payment penalty. And that's basically because you have reasonable cause as it relates to COVID. The eligible employer paid qualified wages to its employees through the calendar year before the required deposit was due, the total amount of federal employment taxes. And that's to make sure that you are not penalized for not paying timely under the CARES Act. And just remember, the eligible employer did not seek payment or an advance. So if you've already filed the 7200 and you have, you're gonna receive the advance credit for the payment, um, then you won't be subjected to the failure to deposit penalty as well. So just keep that in mind. And then for more information, we have lots of sources here. So we're going to look at employer F, an eligible employer that does not receive a paycheck protection program. Now remember, there are three options that you have. And if you avail yourself to any of those three options or those three credits, you are not entitled. So we're going to just keep that in mind as we move along. Okay, so paid in the second quarter, <clears throat> excuse me, employee F pays $10,000 in qualified wages and $3,500 in qualified sick and family leave under this act, among other wages for a payroll period. Employer F has a federal employment tax deposit of $9,000 for the first payroll. And then for the second quarter of 2020, of which 1500 relates to the employer share, Remember, the employer pays a portion of the Social Security and an employee pays the portion, and that's what we're talking about. So what we're doing is deferring the employer share of the Social Security. So the employer, um, the amount of the federal employment taxes don't have to be deposited because he's claiming the credit. So employer F reasonably anticipates a $5,000 employee retention credit. Remember, it's 50% of that $10,000 in wages and a $3,500 credit for paid sick leave. And that's 100% of the federal sick leave for the first quarter. Okay, so let's take a peek at our next frequently asked. Oh, okay, so what I did, I went on irs.gov and I gave some references for the employee retention credit under the CARES Act. And this, you see where the question is. It says the credit is available. So we're gonna back up a little bit. I gave you a little history early on and remember, it's up to $10,000, and the credit is available to all employers 
regardless of the size. And there are two exceptions, state and local governments. The employer's business is fully or partially suspended by the government order during calendar quarters. And the employer's uh, gross receipts are 50% below of what they were for last year. And we did that comparison and we talked about that for last year. And that, so these measurements are calculated each quarter. And that's the good thing about that. So just keep in mind and how the credit is calculated. We talked about that as well earlier. So just remember, how do I qualify? We look at the qualified wages from last year, less than 100 employees. And even if you have more than 100 employees, you'll receive a portion of the credit. Employers can be immediately reimbursed for the credit by reducing their required deposit. We talked about that. That they withhold from the employee's wages by the amount of the credit. So eligible employers will report their total qualified wages and related health insurances for each quarter of their quarter, you know, each quarter of 941 and for the second quarter. So if the employer's employment tax deposits are not sufficient, if you're, if you're an employer and you don't have enough money to make your federal tax deposits to keep making payments to your employees, then you complete a form 7200, advanced payment of employer credit due to COVID-2019. Okay, so let's move on. And this gives all the specificity related to the 7200, and that's the advanced payment of the employer's credit due to COVID-19. And also there are all the recent changes and some of the common errors that may come into play for everyone. Okay. And, okay, that's all that I had. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take a look at some of the questions. Is say, can you address what's available for smaller scale businesses, self-employed and no employees? And my question to the person that posed this, have you reached out to any of the state or local um, jurisdictions regarding credits for your business. That's the, I'm going to type that in. Okay, so I have a few questions that I have to ask you and we can have a really good discussion that'll, that'll give us a better understanding. It says, you, can you address what is available for smaller scale businesses, self-employed and no employees? Okay, so this is my question to assist you with your response. Okay, so it's how many employees? That's one. And okay, that's one. How many employees? Oh, sorry about that. And two is have you because what I am finding is that with the federal credit, it's for larger scale businesses. And that is why I'm asking if you have reached out to the state or, um, or local jurisdictions. And my third question is, have you contacted the SBA? Okay, so I am sending that out. And so let's see. So the person that put in that question, I'm asking you a question that will assist in responding to what you need to know. So what we're gonna, go right ahead. So Don, is, um, so we've seen here that mm -hmm. um, there are no employees with this right. particular person. So exactly. One part of the question, so hopefully, yep. We'll get more information. Yep, but but Don, but Don, this is the thing. The purpose of the credit, and, and that is why I kept trying to repeat it, the credit is to assist you with paying wages to your employees. So if you have no wages to pay, then the credit doesn't apply to you. And I, and I hope that I'm making that clear. I will also, um, I'm gonna type that as well, that the employer retention credit applies to employers who have 
um, who pay wages. That's why we were talking about, we did the example for the qualified wages. We kind of kept going back and forth with that. And, and, and I don't want people to think, well, oh my goodness, did she go over it enough? But that was the purpose of me going over that. It's the employee retention credit. And that is what the credit is for. The credit is to keep, if the employee retention credit applies to employers with employees. And I hope that that helps you out a little bit. So this particular credit does not apply to you. It, it is related to those um, businesses that have employees. And my question again is, so what I will do is, um, Pastor, for all of your attendees, I will reach out to my contacts at the SBA and for the state of Maryland today. And what I will do is provide each one of, I will provide you with a listing or a contact to those agencies. And here you have my personal information. If you wanna reach out, you can, but I will make sure that I will provide the information that's available to the SBA and any smaller organizations for those self-employed persons. I, I know that for, um, and I am not sure if there are any daycare providers on the line, but I know that for daycare providers, there was um, aid provided by the state for self-employed daycare providers. And that is why I'm saying that the state of Maryland had those particular um, credits available for self-employed and for, for small businesses and self-employed persons. So those are things that maybe you may have taken a look at. Has anyone reached out? Um, Don, have you reached out to the state or the local um, municipalities or jurisdictions by chance? Don? Are you still with us? Okay. Yes. Let's see. You see here it says yes. State yes. Employee, yep. want employee info. Nothing, Nothing. local. Okay. Contacted SBA uh -huh. there. Mm -hmm. Basically, this concerns a dance studio that had to shut down and no tuition payments have come in. So there's difficulty paying rent for studio and bills. Okay. Don, you see um, what I will. I would like to ask you to do, and we can get into a little bit more specificity. There's my contact information, and I will put, and I'll put it in the chat, which uh, in the Q&A, um, and you'll get a copy of the report. Send me your information, and what I will do is reach out directly to the state to find out what programs apply to you and to the city. Um, are you local as in and, and also, Don, make sure you include the local jurisdiction where you reside, that particular county, Harford, Anne Arundel, Baltimore County, and I will reach out to um, those local governments to find out what's available. We're not allowed to make a recommendation, and, and I am not allowed to tell you what you can and what you cannot accept, but I will provide you with as much information as I can, and then I will monitor it just to see where you go for your particular situation. See, that's a good thing about what we do. And even our office cannot help you or assist you. It is imperative that I provide you with what you need because it's a learning experience for the both of us. As I had indicated, if somebody didn't share with me about the daycare uh, provider, I would not have known that. So just make sure, um, and I will make sure that I get this um, from Pastor that will let me know ex your exact questions. So that is the thing. Uh, like you said, with the SBA, I will reach out um, to someone. Make sure you email me today and my information's write down my information on the screen and I will reach out to the SBA to find out what is available for you today. And then I will get you some answers. And also, um, let's see. Oh, Prince George, just gotcha. PG County, gotcha. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. PG. And then what I will also do, I speak with the comptroller of the uh, of um, Maryland quite frequently. And I will reach out for that as well, just to try to see if I can give you a contact person that will advise you of what your options are, because knowledge is power. And the more questions you ask, you know, the more opportunity exists for learning for all of us. So, um, like I said, unless someone had came to me regarding a daycare, I transferred them over to the state and they receive their compensation when the parents who were victims of, and we all are, of COVID-19 could not pay tuition. 
uh, I'm sorry, could not pay for daycare. So it seems like you fall into that. Um, and it would, okay, so. so it may have been, um, depending upon the age of some of your clients, that may be something you may take into consideration with the children. So there are a lot of factors that you haven't stated that we need to take a look at. And I will reach out to those offices and ask them to provide you with what is available if federally we cannot assist you. Because that's, that's the purpose of this with the employees. And I, and I am excited about that. I am looking forward to it. And I do thank you. If somebody else, let's see if we have another question. No, none right now. But is there, um, did anybody have any other concerns at, the t at this time that you can think of? Anybody? Let's see. So where have we come from? Can you address what is available for smaller scale business, self-employed with no employees? Smaller scale businesses have some other, and we talked about those other options that is available through IRS. Have, has any of you considered, um, we talked about claiming other credits. And we're gonna, um, Pastor, can we go back a little? There were three credits that we were talking about. And I was trying to get the exact, um, let's see, give me a moment. I'm gonna. Okay, go back just a little. There were three other credits that were available and we're gonna take a look at those. I was trying to get the exact, um, page and I don't want to make noise in your ear which is why I was trying to make sure that there was some other there was an SBA credit and there were a few other um, nope go back a little bit more please yeah I was trying to get the exact page number and I have every there we go so that was the thing that we talked about take a look at the small business loan the paycheck protection program and these are other credit provisions paid family and sick leave credit um, work opportunity credit and and does anybody ha has anybody ever had access to a work opportunity credit do you know what it is just is anybody aware has they have not had access to work opportunity credit and there are requirements for those and this particular section so that's what we're going to do let me um pastor can you take us to irs.gov please sure. thank you ma'am I love technology and, and it's all about the learn and I'm learning too. And I thank her for her graciousness and her guidance for me to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, hopefully you can see it. And we have another question that just came in, please talk about um, that work opportunity credit. So um, we, 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 we do want more information about what the work opportunity credit Sure, is. so go up to the search engine where it says search up top. And, and that is the good thing that I like about the opportunity for the one-on-one. -on -one. We're gonna give you some resources so that you will know um, how to research this information on irs.gov, okay? And click the work opportunity credit where it says about, right there, it says about form 5884 work opportunity credit. Click that. And basically, um, this talks about payments or incurred payments from a targeted group of employees. And you have to have a targeted group of employees. So go to the instructions, which are under the current revision. Didn't know we were gonna go back to school, but of course. There's always opportunities to learn. And the, um, as we had said down the bottom, that the work opportunity credit has been extended to cover employees and that covers wages and, and come down a little bit more. And the purpose of the form, which is right there, it's still talking about businesses. Unfortunately, it's still talking about credits for employees. And that is the difference in this. The work opportunity credit talks about employees from a particular group or particular workforce. 
and they get a certification. I would think that a work opportunity credit may be for a particular group or a particular type of employee that does a particular type of work. And they have to be pre-screened ahead of time. And that's what a work opportunity credit, sort of like, um, and, I, and, I, and this is not because it's a city agency, kind of um, summer work when, um, for me, years ago, I used to work for a summer program when I was in high school, and that is basically where the work opportunity credit lends itself. One moment. While we're waiting for um, Ms. Tubman, um, lead, stakeholder liaison Tubman to come in, we see here on the screen also information about opportunity zones. And I know there's special funding for that for those of you who have employees and are looking for additional tax credits and other information. This is really interesting. Um, and I'll go back um, for, to share some information that um, Ms. Tubman shared earlier, I'll go to actually the irs.gov and actually show you how we navigate through it. Um, she shared this in the webinar around um, involving individuals who would like to learn more information about their impact payments, how to get the payment, if you haven't received your refund yet, what to do. And so basically what she showed is if you're a non-filer, you can uh, go to this first tab here if you want to understand more about what uh, your tax relief options are. You can click on get coronavirus tax relief. You can learn about um, the payments. You can check on your frequently asked questions by clicking here, economic impact payments, get my payment. When you click on this particular um, piece, you'll see all of the information that you may be interested in learning more about. Uh, payment status, who is eligible, who is ineligible, how to input your bank account information if you need to enter your direct deposit information. She also uh, shared about scams and other information as related to um, if you've not received your economic impact payment, what to do. Um, not, of course, to give your information online by phone, to, online and or by phone to anyone. If anyone asks for your social security information, you're not to give that information out or any other personal identifying information. There's so many scams that she talks about, and you can also find that on the irs.gov. And it's just important for some who've already filed, um, not businesses, of course, but individuals who filed, they found that perhaps they've not received their payment and or their payment came in a check form because it was an unable, um, they didn't have direct deposit information on file. So those are just some of the things that you too can go to irs.gov and input. Also just wanna let you know, if you need additional information, as related to any of these things, uh, a .gov uh, webpage is more um, reliable and, um, oh, sorry, here, there's a question. There's some other things that are coming in. So just please, again, make sure you, you get, from, get information from a reputable uh, in, uh, organization, preferably .gov. So I'm gonna go to the chat to find out what you have here. Um, does the individual, this is from Laura James, does the individual or organization apply for the work opportunity credit? It, it appears from the website that it's the, the organization that applies for the work opportunity credit and these opportunity credits and these opportunity credits are available for 501c3 and 4. Okay, and so she says never mind. So she can see here that um, from what uh, Ms. Tubman shared is that basically we can go to the webpage and get all the information that we need there by typing in the search. All right, so that appears to be um, all that we have here. Let me check and see if there's anything else before she comes back to join us. She's talked about that. She's talked about opportunity credits. I want to share some other things here. Um, there were some other pieces that she shared in a previous webinar that I just want to make sure that I share with you. Um, again, this is one of the pieces that I really love about Ms. Tubman in her presentation. She always gives the references needed. She, said, she gives us references needed, but I just want to share with you that if there's anything that you have a question about and you want to know exactly where it is, you can always search it and, and, and look for that reference and the access date for that information. Okay, I'll be quiet yeah. so that she can finish. Thank you, Ms. Right. your bag. Yeah, I th thank you so much. I do apologize. As we indicated, technology is a great thing when it works, but then it, then when it does not work, it challenges us. Okay, so also 
while we're shifting gears, I just wanted to, and I apologize, Pastor, was there something that you were discussing? You were talking about the frequently asked questions mm -hmm. because I was about to get into the economic stimulus payment. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I just shared a little bit about what you shared in the previous webinar and talked about the sure. GOV. And so please. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I do apologize for that. As we had said, technology is a great thing. And, um, but as she had indicated, it's great. She's got to get my payment frequently asked questions up on the screen. So from the audience, I just need to make sure, even though we're going to shift gears from the economic uh, retention credit, to make sure that everybody is getting their, um, their economic stimulus payment. If you are not, I recommend that you go online under the get, um, there is an option that says get my payment to make sure that your information is there. Some things that I need you to be very mindful of, um, you can access get my payment, which will ask you some particular questions and it will find out what your payment status is. If your payment status is not available, let's go over. I'm going to take a look at the frequently asked questions at the bottom. And as we go along, if you have some more questions, let me know. All right. So for some of the frequently asked questions, let's take a look. A lot of people have been having um, concerns with banking information. I think that's where we are now. Where did the IRS get my bank information and what if I need to change it now? If you filed a 2018-2019 tax return and you were entitled to a refund, whatever banking information you listed on that return is where your, it's where your funds are going to go. Now, if that is where we're getting your bank information from, if you got a refund. Now, if you're retired and you've been blessed to be retired and not have to work, then your banking information comes directly from wherever your social security payments or your retirement checks come from. Another concern is in the event there is a problem with either one of those um, resources, then you would, you would be receiving a paper check. Now, if your bank information has changed, there is a tool that you would go into it's called non-filer information and you can update all of your information directly there. So that is the only, now the other question says, I no longer have the bank account that I used for direct deposit on my return. Can I change it using get my payment? You're going to go right under the non-filer like we talked about and change your information. Just remember if, there we go. Thank you. I love it. If the bank account is closed, I was about to say the bank's going to reject your deposit and they're going to issue a payment by check. So the get my payment application says that if it says your payment is processed, you cannot change anything. Once you go check that and the get my payment says that your payment is being sent, if it goes to the bank and there's a problem, the bank is going to return it to us and we will send you an electronic payment. I've been told some people have even, um, nothing's changed and they got a paper check. You got to remember now they're sending out over 8 million checks. And, I, and I'm not making excuses, but it's just humans and that's who we are. Unfortunately, um, the, none of us are as perfect as that, um, the one that we know. So we, those things do happen, unfortunately. And it says, can I use get my payment to check the direct deposit status if I changed my payment method to direct deposit? And come down there. Okay, sorry about that. Yep, you can use the get my payment to check your payment option and you can do updates to payment status. But you can only do one a day. So just try to make sure you have all of your banking information with you once you go on and you do that to make sure that all is well. Okay. And did, are there any other questions in particular that somebody needs to have answered that we maybe we did not go over? Okay, I'm going to take a peek in the chat to see if there's, were there still payment, still questions related to the economic stimulus? Because I'm not going to move until you're good about it. And another thing, if you are a married person, now keep this in mind, and you were entitled to $2,400 and you have two children and you do not receive those.
claim money tax return as a credit. That's something we need to, to keep in mind. If you have an address change, you can go in online, click that for me for your address change. And no, this does the get my payment up. Oh, it does not allow you to change your address. And we had a question that just popped up. So let me take a peek at it so I can see the. Jan had a question about the work opportunity. Okay. Um, so so it's, it's, you, you want us to repeat what she said about um, married couples. I believe the question that came in, okay. um, are, are you there, Veronica? I am. Yes, I am. There's, there's a question about repeating what you said about married couples. So if you file jointly and you find that you've okay. not... Yes. I'm not able to hear her well, but I, I, I think I, I remember um, this particular question. And basically what, what, what the, the question that came in was if, a, if there's a couple, they filed jointly. And yes. When, can can we you hear me? I apologize, Pastor. Go right ahead. No, no, no. We can hear you now. You, okay. you can go ahead. and. No. So the question was, give me the specific question so I can speak to that specifically. I want to make sure I have all the facts before I answer that. Give it to me again, please. She asked you to, to repeat what you said about married couples. Okay. What I was... And the requirement... Oh, we're losing well, you. You know, the, the money... You're, we can't hear you very well. So sorry about that. So I guess I'm going to finally, finally answer this question. Basically, it was around you, you're, you jointly file, you have children, um, and you didn't receive the $500 tax credit for each child. And basically, the response to that from the IRS website is you can claim that on your um, 2021 tax return. So that's pretty much what she, um, what Ms. Tubman um, said, was about to say. Yeah, if she's still here. And we 2020, can hear. not 2021. Yes. Can yes. you hear me, Pat? Yes, yes, yes. Correction. Yeah, you claim it on your 2021. On the 2020 return. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Great timing. Okay, so it's here we are. My nephew continues to see payment status not available. Did you pull up the frequently asked questions? No, but we have two, we have two minutes and we have one question um, oh, no. just came okay. in and we're, we're going to answer it. We'll take our time to answer this. It says, my nephew continues to see payment status not available. All right. So let's see here. My nephew continues to see payment status not available. Hello? You said my nephew continues to see payment status unavailable. Right. And so she wants to know what to do with that. So here we are. To check to see what his status was. And how old is your nephew? question is he claim can you hear me hello yeah it's cut it's cutting in and out um but let's see we have a response here i'm 29 her nephew is 29 years old is your and All right, so here you have it. Um, so what we did um, here on the web page, we, we typed in status not available 
And as you'll see on the screen, here's the response as of April 15, 2020. So hopefully there can be some more updated information. But basically it just says, get updated information on why you may get payment status not available in our frequently asked questions. So we could possibly, um, could possibly look here. And what I'll ask um, Veronica to do is circle back to that question and make sure that when we send out the slides for today and um, the link for the YouTube recording of this session that we will have that answer included. Thank you again. Thank you again for joining us here today. It's two o'clock. I appreciate your time here with us. Again, we are at Baltimore Washington Conference Advocacy in Action Network. Please just help me once again thank Veronica Tubman, stakeholder liaison from the Internal Revenue Service for being here with us today. I also wanna thank the entire team and committee behind the scenes helping to make this possible. Um, we have Jan Taylor, uh, Giovanni Arroyo, Rochelle Andrews, Andrea Johnson, and um, Ann Price. We give God thanks for them. Um, and let's see one more thing here before we go. I just want to make sure I see this. Um, okay, bless you. Thank you all again for joining us. And um, God bless you. Stay safe, stay well.